Uh, good morning, good evening, hello to all of you, and thank you for tuning in for our monthly webinar. Uh, next month will be our first anniversary, so I'm really glad that today we have Denis, Denis Mitrano uh, to give us the 13th, the last talk of the year uh, today. Uh, she did her PhD in uh, geochemistry at the university, uh, sorry, the School of Mines in uh, Colorado. And then she went on to do a postdoc at the federal, the Swiss Federal Institute of Material Science and Technology. And then she was a group leader for the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology. She is now an assistant professor uh, in the uh, un, uh, sorry Environmental Systems Science Department of ETH Zurich, uh, Switzerland, in Switzerland. Uh, as an environmental analytical chemist, her research focuses on um, the distribution and impacts of anthropogenic materials. She is in particular interested in developing analytical, analytical tool to systematically understand the mechanism and processes driving the fate, transport, and biological interactions of particles, such as engineered uh, nan nanomaterials and nano and microplastics. In this context, her research group uses her result, these results to assess risk of anthropogenic materials right on the boundary of environmental science, material science, and policy. And today she will tell us how uh, microplastic regulation should be more precise to incentivize both innovation and environmental safety. Uh, before I give uh, the floor to Denise, uh, I would like to invite you to all go uh, on your web browser and uh, type in slidu, S-L-I.D-U, and then type the uh, key that is OPW, all capital letters. So you can um, ask your questions uh, while she is giving her talk that will last for about 30 minutes. And then at the end of the talk, I will be reading uh, the questions and um, she'll be answering them. And this should uh, last for um, just about an hour. So uh, once again, Denise, uh, thank you so much for uh, join joining us today. I'm very excited to uh, listen to your talk and to uh, read all these amazing questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and the floor is yours. Great, thanks so much, Audrey. And thanks to all the folks over at Plastic Web uh, the Ocean Plastic Webinar for inviting me today to be able to present some of our recent work. So I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen, which hopefully should now be working. Um, so yeah, as I was nicely introduced, my name is Denise Matrano and I'm assistant professor uh, in the Environmental System Science Department at ETH. And today I'd like to discuss with you a bit more about microplastic regulations and how they can incentivize both industrial innovation and environmental safety. So this was based off a recent work that I had published in Nature Communications with a colleague from BASF, which is a German chemical company. I think that this is a nice interaction uh, to be able to see how scientists and industry can also work together to be able to help regulators to make more informed decisions about how we can use plastic more sustainably and have better environmental health uh, as a consequence. So as many of you might already know, when we start off with thinking about plastic and plastic pollution, how do we get to this plastic world? So how do we get from this material, which was really a wonder material for throw away living to this, where every place that we look on the globe is littered with plastic pollution, especially on beaches in the marine system, but also in terrestrial and freshwater environments. So this really starts to have us think about how we use plastic throughout its whole life cycle. So the plastic life cycle itself really depends on materials and the end of use and how we can effectively produce uh, materials, um, use them for their certain amount of time, potentially recycle some of these materials if it is envisioned within this particular material life cycle. And then it, when it reaches the end of use be discarded. And this waste management practice can um, vary depending on where you are in the world. Um, some plastic waste is simply incinerated and others are discarded. 
So hopefully we would have discarded waste that is well managed in that case, at least going into a landfill if it's not being able to be recycled or incinerated. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of plastic waste ends up in the environment. And that's, of course, what a lot of the um, different talks have been focusing on in the Ocean Plastics webinar series. And so it's not only just the plastic waste in the environment itself, which is an environmental consequence for our plastic ap appetite. So what other environmental impacts do we have with our reliance on this plastic material? So firstly, as we know, a lot of plastics are made out of um, uh, petroleum. And so there's a lot of um, carbon emissions and energy use, which is uh, required to be able to source this raw material as well as just producing the material itself. And so it's not a carbon neutral activity just to be able to produce the plastic even in the first place. Now, this production has been increasing significantly um, over the last 50 years or 60 years as um, plastics have been introduced into our daily life. So if we look at this graph starting in the 1950s when polymers were starting to be introduced into the wider public until today, we've had an exponential increase in the amount of plastics which is being used. However, it's really important to know that this really depends on the sector that the plastic is being used in, and that will really influence the total lifetime of the usable material which is being used. Um, and so, for example, if we use plastics in building and construction, this will have a relatively long lifetime of 35 years or industrial machinery, 20 years. And oftentimes these plastics are well regulated and collected after the building is renovated or taken down. However, when we look at some of the materials which have a shorter lifetime, like textiles, consumer products, or packaging, it has a significantly lower or shorter lifetime than these other materials. Um, and so for the case of packaging, it's even less than six months that the plastic packaging is actually having a productive life cycle. And unfortunately, packaging is one of the major um, constituents that make up plastic waste today in the environment, and it's most likely to be mismanaged. And so one way to try to overcome this mismanagement and to be able to use these materials longer is through different recycling processes. And while, of course, this is really important that we continue to recycle, we have to also keep in mind that the recycling process itself might not always be the best solution depending on which materials that we're using because a lot of impurities can go through the recycling chain. So um, whether these are flame retardants or other plasticizers, this may um, influence how these other chemicals might be distributed to other types of plastic. And also when we recycle plastic, it is generally a downgrading of materials. So you don't have the same material property when you have virgin plastic and recycled plastic. And so when we get towards the end of the plastic life cycle, this is where we may indeed have a mismanagement of plastic waste and plastic can go into the environment. So there's been a lot of um, work about how plastic has getting into ocean waterways, but here's one example of how plastic can be emitted to fresh waterways. And here in um, yellow is the business as usual. So if we don't have any change in how we use our pl plastics, we can expect to have an increasing amount of plastic being emitted to fresh waterways. However, luckily there are some um, different regulations which are coming in place for better plastic management. And so even if we meet these um, target goals that these regulations um, imply, we will still have about 8 million metric tons which are entering the surface waterways. And so, of course, while these um, regulations and goals are great to be able to reach, it still has a lot of plastic which will reach the environment, which of course will be very persistent for a really long time. And now that is talking about microplastic um, emissions to waterway, excuse me, macroplastic emissions to waterways and how large plastic items might be there. But the rest of this talk will actually focus on microplastic. So what is microplastic? Microplastic are small solid particles that are less than five millimeters in size. Um, they can come from a number of different sources, such as the degradation of plastic bottles or the shedding of microplastic fibers from textiles. And these can eventually make their way into every environment um, across the globe. So every place that's been sampled so far has seen evidence of different types of microplastic pollution. And so when the public starts to see some of these images um, and get more concerned, 
we might start to think that smaller plastics gain bigger attention. So I'm sure in the popular media, most of you have seen different types of headlines like this. There's some beautiful place, but it's poisoned with microplastic. Microplastic is found in the snow from the Alps to the Arctic. Microplastics are in our drinking water, and are we even eating our fleece jackets? Microplastics are in our food. So I show these examples as a little bit of hyperbole and a lot of clickbait about what the media is actually portraying, what scientists propone, uh, proposedly know about microplastics, but what do we as scientists really know or what is unknown? And so today, the eco and human toxicological effects are really uncertain. So even though a lot of work is being done in this space, there's no really clear evidence to say what the effects might be. While we've been able to measure plastic everywhere that we have um, sampled so far, there's really little concrete information on the actual sources of microplastic and its distribution, and the dominant fate and transport processes are really not yet defined. And so in this way, both in hazard and exposure assessment, their risk assessment in totality is still subject to a lot of large uncertainties. However, what we do know is that plastic and subsequently microplastic is a really persistent material, which is widely dispersed in many ecosystems. And so there's a lot of unknown ecological consequences. So this definitely is something that needs to be continued to be investigated. Um, so that we can uh, have a better environmental health and safety as we use these different materials, which are so integral into our everyday lives. So when we start to look about how we can start to answer this question, we first need to assess the microplastic inputs and implications in the environment. And so for those of you who might be a little bit familiar with most of the work that I do, this is the space that our uh, lab is mostly working in looking at fate and transport of plastic and interaction of plastic with biota to be able to really understand how plastic moves through environmental systems and the implications that they have. But we started to want to use this scientific basis that we have started to gain from plastic assessment and how that might be able to be applied to different regulations. So we would hope to be able to develop regulations to, cur to, cur to, excuse me, to curtail the unnecessary and negative impacts of plastic and eventually be able to design more sustainable and environmentally conscious materials. And so that is really, of course, the ultimate goal, that we can still have uh, materials which function well in our everyday life, but are not damaging to the environment. So when we start to look at this really um, large puzzle, how are we going to be able to approach regulation from the multifaceted microplastic problem? And so here's the, the outline of the rest of the talk, which I'd like to discuss with you today. The first aspect is taking a short tour of the polymer universe from primary microplastics to functional polymers. Secondly, we can try to cluster specific uses of solid plastic to, uh, to identify environmental pollution and the health risk issues that may come from having plastics in the environment. We want to start to delineate the social and corporate drivers prompting informal norms and formal regulations. So how did these regulations actually come into place and are they really fit for purpose? Then we can, um, once knowing these different um, regulations, evaluate the strategies and effectiveness of the regulations, which are currently underway. And finally, look at priority cases where regulation can be focused and precision can be increased so that uh, companies continue to make in it, can continue to make innovative new materials, but also be able to be focused on environmental protection. So for the first step, a short tour of the polymer universe. So here, polymers and plastics exist on a spectrum from solid particles, such as primary microplastics, to soluble functional polymers. So in this graph, we sort all species of primary microplastics by decreasing solubility, decreasing solidity to increasing solubility from left to right. So polymers and plastic regulation is often based on these physical characteristics, such as solidity, solubility, and percent of particles which are actually in the material. And so the light gray species, which are on the right of the graph, are typically um, low molar mass materials with high functionalization. And these are therefore called functional polymers. And these are generally not considered microplastics since they don't really have a solid form. And that way, they're not really considered part of this regulatory process. So it's only the dark gray and medium gray species, which we're actually going to be considering when we talk about the primary microplastic regulations. And it's these physical properties of plastics and their use in final products and formulations, which can also influence how they might enter the environment. 
And so when we look at this large umbrella of all the different types of polymers which can be produced, it might start to become clear that as a whole, a one size fits all regulation will not be able to encompass the diversity of different polymers which are used uh, because of the different types of materials that exist. And so really this diversity of polymers and applications complicates risk assessment a lot. So we can look a little bit more about how these different um, materials can enter the environment as uh, solid microplastics. Um, so this is a large puzzle of how the different plastics can um, reach the environment. And so some of these puzzle pieces are interconnected by how the different plastics can um, get into the environment. So in the dark red, the yellow and the orange, this is all breakdown of larger plastic items which are releasing plastics into the environment, such as breaking down of fishing nets, bottles or tires, textiles or mulching films in agriculture. There may be other places where plastics are used um, directly in a consumer product, such as scrubbers in um, cosmetics or application of different agrochemicals that are encapsulated in microplastics. And then this is an area where plastics can be directly released into the environment already as microplastics. So um, normally REACH regulation, REACH is the Registration, Evaluation, Authorization and Restriction of Chemicals in Europe, considers singular compounds. But in the case of microplastic, all of them are considered collectively regardless of the polymer that they're made from and um, also regardless of um, how they are making their way into the environment. So overarching chemical bans can be appropriate when there's a clear and overwhelming evidence that targeted substances cause harm like DDT or CFCs, but is this really the case with microplastics? And can all microplastics be regulated in the same way, considering they have a really heterogeneous group of materials that we're discussing, or can they even be regulated at all? I think that really depends on where the microplastic is coming from in the environment. So if we start to look at the probable ranking of microplastic sources in the environment, this is how we might be able to start to break apart that puzzle piece from the previous slide. So the largest source of microplastic is certainly the breakdown of larger plastic items, which are mismanaged plastic waste into the environment. And so this is from sources one to three. And microplastics then um, can be reduced in the environment if we can also reduce macroplastic pollution. And so therefore the goals of better waste management, improving material design and circular economy are really still uh, top priorities, even when we're discussing microplastic and nanoplastic. And so the chemical composition of primary microplastics that contribute to sources four and five, so agrochemicals and uh, body scrubs, for example, are highly diverse, um, and, but they are a point source which might be able to be targeted for regulation. And so if we want to target regulations on microplastics specifically, then we would want to be able to know what hazards that these particles may pose when they're actually in these formulations and get released into the environment. So can we start to bridge the risk assessment of microplastics with other particles and chemicals? So there are already a lot of um, test guidelines and regulatory tests for how other chemicals are being assessed, such as OECD test guidelines or ISO standardized methods. But the concept of hazard testing is really challenged for microplastics because there's few standardized tests which are available for materials that specifically have low solubility, such as polymers, and <clears throat> large particles. So sometimes these particles are so large that they can even be larger than the standardized test organisms, which makes it practically very difficult. And so far, at least in scientific literature, the toxicity data don't yet define which properties of the microplastic are most important when we're discussing hazard. So is it the size of the microplastic, the shape, the chemical compositions, or the additives? And so it's necessary to be able to understand what specific properties of microplastic are actually inducing harm so that those can be avoided in future formulations. When we start to discuss the idea of nanospecific toxicity, we've been seeing that the particle composition is normally most important. And this goes back to the um, work that we had previously done with engineered nanomaterials. So um, uh, engineered nanomaterials, which are made of metals or inorganic species, often have more propensity to dissolve or have um, a reactive surface. And therefore, the type of material that the, the nanomaterial is made of may be what is causing the most harm. 
However, plastics overall have less dissolution than engineered nanomaterials. They have lower surface reactivity and therefore less inflammation potential than these inorganic nanomaterials. And so again, the concepts of hazard testing are a little bit different from nanoplastics to engineered nanomaterials. And finally, the bioavailability of macromolecules um, is relatively low, <clears throat> but it has to be pointed out that the leaching of the lower, last, lower mass uh, additives can induce relative hazards. Um, and so while the plastic itself may or may not be specifically hazardous, these chemicals which are um, inherently in the plastic may be more hazardous and also worth regulating and mentioning. And so when we look at this in a bit of a larger view, um, we can really appreciate that research on colloids and engineered, na engineered nanomaterials has revealed that there are certain size limits and thresholds where some physiochemical processes dominate environmental behavior. And so this can also be uh, examined from the viewpoint of plastics and nanoplastic. And so here in the center of the chart, we can see the size range. And in gray, we have the area of nanoplastics specifically. Now there's two different uh, definitions of nanoplastics, less than one micron and less than hundred nanometers. So both are in different shades of gray here, but nevertheless, we may still be able to see that certain particle sizes may be the driving factor for both biological interactions and environmental transport. So in the upper part of the graph, we look at the different biological interactions, which are normally occurring at different particle sizes. So in the nano range, we can know that we can inhale particles, ingest particles, cross biological barriers, or be taken up into cells. But when we get into a larger size range, then maybe only portion of these different um, biological interactions will be possible because the particle is simply too large. Likewise, when we look on the bottom half of the graph in purple for chemistry and transport, we might be able to see that there are certain size limitations which would um, allow plastics to move in certain ways. So at smaller sizes, plastics may um, have an increased sorption to the matrix, for example, soil or other um, uh, materials that are floating in an aquatic environment, but larger size particles might not have those same transport processes. So again, just being able to rely on some of our um, previous knowledge on colloids and engineered nanomaterials might give us a good starting point about where to look for the hazards of nanoplastic and microplastic. But until now, we've kind of discussed together a little bit of a scientific approach and reasonings behind microplastic imp uh, impacts and exposure. But a lot of the legislation around microplastics has come from a more emotional level first. So how did microplastics become a topic for public comment and for public concern? And so in this way, we can start to look at how policy developments and industrial practices are impacted by consumer behavior. So one of the main um, topics which brought the vast amount of plastic pollution to light in um, the general public was um, filming like uh, Blue Planet 2, which showed a huge amount of plastic that was in the environment. And this called a lot of people to um, ask for more legislation to reduce the amount of plastic which is um, mismanaged and getting into the environment. And so everyone said, okay, say no more to plastic. And we tried to avoid plastic use, especially um, single use plastic items and um, pack plastic packaging. And so this brought around some um, developments about how to reduce plastic bags, for example, where grocery stores would start to charge only a few cents to be able to have a plastic bag to encourage people to bring more reusable bags. And these bans or small charges were really effective. So for most places that charged only a few cents for their plastic bags, uh, plastic bag um, usage dropped by 90 or 95 percent. So it was really effective. And so this worked well for some types of uh, macroplastic that was being used, but what about microplastic? And so one of the first um, topics that, the, um, that, that was uh, taken under the idea of reduction of plastic in the environment in terms of microplastic specifically was looking at the reduction of these microbeads. And so these are different beads that are put into um, consumer goods and um, cosmetics as scrubbing agents. And so this was really the genesis of the microplastic regulation. So there were camp campaigns such as beat the micromade, mi beat the microbead, or look for zero plastic inside. Um, and then there were these images to show just really how much plastic is somehow hidden inside these different consumer products. 
Um, however, this was a pretty relatively low hanging fruit for um, regulation because it was easy to justify a replacement. So there was a low benefit to impact ratio. So we don't really get so much benefit from having these microplastics in our cosmetics, maybe just a little bit of extra clean skin. Um, but there were a lot of technically simple alternatives to replace microbeads, such as different natural alternatives with shells or clays or things like this. Um, so this sort of regulations and bans were generally accepted to stop use by consumers, regulators, and the industry alike. And so it was an early, easy win um, for microplastic regulation. However, microplastics are not only used in things like cosmetics, and they're also not always so simple to replace. So um, the, uh, the idea of easy replacement is not applicable to all different types of microplastic usage. So the regulation consequently has also become a little bit more complex. So let's start to take a little bit of a look at the current microplastic regulations. So in the EU, um, the REACH, the European um, uh, Chemicals Agency, starts to have this principle of no data, no market to ensure the safe use of chemicals. Now, this isn't only with plastics and microplastics, but any type of chemicals that can be in any product or material. And so in the case of polymers, we have a tiered approach about how we're actually assessing these um, different polymers. So first you need to have the regulation of the polymer itself. However, it's often exempted because polymers have a low bioavailability. So there are some sector specific regulations that apply such as for food packaging material or children's toys. But overall, most times polymers are um, of low concern because they don't have this solubility aspect and are not bioavailable, the polymer itself. However, what might be more um, bioavailable is the additives. So there is also a regulation of additives. So in the EU, um, if there is more than one ton that is manufactured, it will be subject to REACH regulations. And in the US, there's uh, chemicals or substances to Tosca regulations. Um, and lastly, then we can also look at how these existing regulations might apply to the proposed microplastic regulation. Um, so when we look at the regulation of primary solid microplastics, which are directly used in products, there's really various regulations and reporting in place or proposed regionally, which I'll get into a little bit more on the next slide about how the different jurisdictions handle the different uh, microplastic uses. But this microplastic regulation is actually still separate from the um, existing regulations of polymers and the regulations of additives. However, this idea of um, microplastic regulation can also really hinge on what is the definition of a microplastic. And so it was really a complex definition which was proposed by ECHA. And so this is really um, difficult because it's products that are containing 0.01% of microplastic particles which are defined as particles that are solid polymer, where of more than 1% are below five millimeters in size. So it's a really small amount of plastics which are added to a product, which would then be subject to regulation. They also include fibers between three nanometers and 15 millimeters, so quite a large size range. And difficultly, if particles have any composition at all, but they have a polymer content of over 1%, then this can also be considered a microplastic. So this starts to include really a huge amount of different substances. Um, and even if we were all happy with this uh, definition of what is a microplastic, it's actually analytically very challenging to be able to measure this. So for those of you who work in just measuring microplastics in the environment, even when you have a 200 micron particle that you're trying to analyze, um, which is a pure polymer, you can already uh, appreciate how time consuming and difficult that is. But to be able to be able to say something is a microplastic based off the ECHA definition becomes even more difficult. And so in that case, if it's not measurable, it's not really enforceable. And so um, if uh, we need to either develop better analytics and a system to be able to test and screen different materials, which may or may not contain microplastics, or be able to make a regulation which can actually be followed. And so if we look a little bit closer about the current microplastic regulations around the globe, here uh, me and my co-author had specifically looked at the EU, US, China, and South Korea as some examples. And so as already mentioned, there's some regulation um, of the polymer itself on the highest level, but this is um, often exempted from REACH or TOSCA because of um, low solubility and they're considered polymers of low concern. 
When we look at the regulation of the additives, as mentioned, these are um, regulated separately from the polymer. Um, but lastly, we can look again at this regulation of primary solid microplastics. So um, in the US and South Korea and China, most of this is based still on these body scrubs. But in uh, the EU, this has been expanded in reach or proposed to be expanded in reach um, and by some of these uh, new definitions and regulations, which I had mentioned on the previous slide. So this can make um, it much more demanding for companies to be able to um, produce materials. And um, that would also cause a lot more reporting and checking of materials to see if these um, plastics are really in materials or not. But um, again, regardless of if uh, we think that the um, definition or the regulation is good or not, uh, does the solution, the current regulations, actually solve the problem, which is the major sources of microplastic? So here we can look about the different types of materials which the current uh, proposed regulations would actually cover. So on the right side of the graph are those primary microplastics um, which constitute a fraction of a product or are used in the open environment. So these are the specific materials where registration is in place regionally or currently under discussion. So this can be things like agrocapsules, seed coatings, or cosmetic exfoliants, which I mentioned before. In the middle, we have microplastics, which are not subject to regulation because these are intermediate materials. So um, this is different um, uh, pre-production pellets and so that during processing lose their microplastic form and so are no longer considered under regulation. And on the left side in the red, orange, and yellow, we see that the polymer makes up the bulk of the product and it's solid, but it is not containing directly any microplastics. It only becomes microplastic later through degradation. And so in this case, microplastic regulations don't apply. So when we compare this to the different sources of environmental microplastics, we can already see that the bulk of the microplastics, which will be in the environment, actually don't have microplastic regulations that will apply. And so the new microplastic regulations are really just going to cover a few um, percent maybe of the materials um, that are getting their way into the environment. And so, um, how can this transition from just concern and writing some legislation to actual action and um, changing this problem? So from concern to action, coordinated efforts to drive real or sometimes perceived change. So the consumer industry can leverage selling products via emotions quite easily, I would say. And so they can start to come up with different products which will help stop microplastics reaching the environment, such as um, these different laundry bags, which you can wash your clothes in to trap the microplastic fibers or special laundry devices to trap the microplastic fiber. Um, while these won't necessarily hurt, of course, to use them, I mean, I do question how useful it is to produce more consumer materials, oftentimes made out of plastic, to capture microplastic. And so this is an, uh, uh, an idea or a suggestion of how, you know, maybe the consumer is relying on emotions a little bit too much to be able to have consumers just buy more material. And so um, it's really a vague concept of corporate sustainability, also not just for selling products, but also on a higher level when companies release corporate sustainability um, co concepts, for example. And so we really need measurable and enforceable regulations when a company says that they're actually being more green to make sure that they actually follow up with these promises and not just be greenwashing. And so um, consumer industries really uh, wish to offer a feel-good premium to consumers to amplify their tendencies of purchasing goods and services, which resonate with this positive and eco ecologically conscious choices, but it doesn't mean that these actually make a large change. And so without policy restricting certain materials or technologies or additives, um, it's oftentimes that companies will go for short-term sustainability solutions and goals and instead of having long-term goals. And so it's really superficial changes without some sort of regulation pushing industry to make investments for the future. And so in this way, these investments, the decisive element in changing industry and consumer behavior, behavior is cost. So a nice example of this is that biodegradability used to be a nice to have feature for a lot of materials, 
but now consumers are willing to pay more for this material. Um, and so that way it can help offset the costs of some of this R&D. And also companies may be more um, inclined to have investments in recycling and uh, the circular economy if they know that there's a market for this type of materials as well. So when we look at the relative impacts of using plastic to other materials, what do we have to consider for primary microplastics in terms of regulation for the future? So what are the environmental health impacts caused by microplastic use? And specifically, can we link plastics with any aspects of hazards? So that way we know specifically which types of materials to avoid. What alternatives currently exist or can be brought to the market in the near term, which provides simpler, similar functionality? So this was a case that I mentioned earlier, for example, with the body scrubs, where there were other um, materials which are existing, which cause less harm. And so this was an easy substitution. In that case, it was easy, but not um, in all products can you have this easy substitution. And um, coming back to the cost, what is the cost of these replacement materials and to whom? So is it only the consumer who's going to be paying more for the materials or will the company also be reducing their bottom line a little bit? And hopefully, ideally, can substitutions be developed that outperform microplastics with fewer adverse outcomes? And so this is really possible, again, if we know what hazards that we are trying to avoid and that companies start to be able to um, target these more environmentally friendly and sustainable materials. So if we come back again to this idea of looking through the whole um, idea of gaining um, general knowledge about microplastics in the environment to regulation to environmental sustainable materials, I'd just like to give you a very uh, short overview of the type of ongoing work that we do to assess impacts of nanoplastics and microplastics. So this is in the area of fate and transport. So we looked at improved sampling and analytics for microplastics and nanoplastics, settling dynamics in lakes and ocean, transport through porous media and soils and impacts on soils, and the eco-corona formation on plastic. Since I was working at a water science uh, institute previous to ETH, then of course we also look at a lot of water treatment. So we look at flux through wastewater and drinking water treatment plants. Um, I'm not an eco ecotoxicologist by training, but I work with a lot of ecotoxicologists. So we look at interactions with biota, so plastic trophic transfer, bioconcentration, bioturbation of plastics within the soil column and cellular uptake and signaling. And um, finally, from my work at the Material Science Research Institute, which I used to work, we have continued work on um, microplastic fiber reduction. So looking at the releases of fibers when textiles are washed or worn, um, making um, washing machine filters, um, either for in the home or industrial wastewater treatment plants, and also um, hopefully designing textiles which are shedding less microplastic fibers throughout their entire life cycle. So when we look at the future outlook for regulations and material design, um, the bottom line for regulation is that we really need things that are measurable and enforceable. And then that is sometimes easier said than done, of course. The current regulations leave little room for the development for the industry, except for plastic-free alternatives, which might not necessarily be viable and maybe be too hard of a line. And so in this way, more precise and directed regulations would allow industry to test or screen for the most hazardous properties of the different materials that they're using, and then that way they can opt for sensible alternatives. However, we can't get our way out of the environmental crisis for plastic by microplastic regulation alone. So we really need to be able to develop more sustainable materials and targeted microplastic use when it's necessary. And we need to keep in mind that a lot of research has been um, uh, research and money has been going into the current material design, both about on their physical and chemical properties, as well as their cost. And so these materials are really optimized from the viewpoint of the manufacturers to make a lot of material very cheaply. Um, however, with additional research and development, alternative materials should be able to catch up in terms of both price and performance compared to conventional materials. And hopefully this will be a way um, to reduce plastic in the future, plastic pollution in the future. Um, so if you're interested um, in some of the topics that I've discussed today, it's um, going into a lot more detail in two of the recent publications which we published. So I would uh, suggest that you take a look at those. Maybe you can 
read the written text going a little smoother than I was able to present today. Um, and with that, I would like to say thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to discuss with you further now um, in the Q&A session. Thanks very much. Thank you for this very uh, interesting uh, talk. I would have loved to listen to it for another, you know, like 30 minutes at least, because it was very um, interesting and a lot of information. And well, thank you. It was great. Uh, we have some uh, questions. Uh, first, I want to uh, invite again our viewers to go on Slido, S L I dot D O. Uh, with the uh, hashtag uh, OPW, all in capital letters, so you can uh, jump in and um, ask more questions and uh, vote for your favorite questions, of course. So um, first of all, um, someone asked uh, about the reach uh, restrictions um, that you were um, describing. Uh, they exempt uh, biodegradable uh, plastic are there norms to characterize uh, the biodegradability of plastic in Europe and in the rest of the world? So how do we, what does it mean? And like, how do we characterize it? Yeah, so that's a good point. They are um, omitting um, biodegradable plastics from the current regulation, um, but that's um, also because uh, most times biodegradable plastics are not really focused on a micro-sized biodegradable plastic to start. These are probably more materials like mulching films or, or drinks containers and things like that. Um, there are some norms which are looking at micro uh, the biodegradability regulations, but I have to say this is not an area that I know so many specifics about, but some colleagues of mine um, are looking into this further. And I know that they are questioning a lot of the norms which are um, in place currently about uh, biodegradability so yeah sorry i can't answer that one so so much oh no it's uh, it's it's already much more than than i knew <laughs> um so someone um uh compliments on your talk saying it, it was a great talk uh can you comment on bio-based uh plastic microplastic yeah so here this is really just looking on the source material and so instead of having petroleum it's having instead um, a, a biosource like some sort of cellulose or something like this and so while it might have a biological source material it doesn't necessarily mean that it's more environmentally friendly or that it will then be degradable so irregardless of the source material whether it's petroleum or um, cellulose or some other sort of bio-based material this could be designed in a way either that it is non-biodegradable or biodegradable so um, the the source material alone doesn't guarantee better environmental safety. But when we look at the start of the life cycle, it does start to help when we look at bio-based materials because then we don't have to extract so much petroleum and we can um, hopefully be able to use feedstocks which would otherwise not be used. So like food processing waste may be able to be used to be able to create plastics. So even at the end of life, if we don't necessarily see a big distinct difference yet, at the start of the life cycle, this may be places where um, we could get some gains from bio-based plastic. All right, thank you. Um, someone is asking, do we have any alternative for car tires? Uh, on which we entrust our lives. And uh, I just want to ask on top of this, do you know how much of the car tires are microplastic? Um, like what's the proportion of this you know, pollution compared to the rest of the, the pollution of microplastics? Yeah, so I don't have like an exact uh, figure. And I think that in generally we're not at the point to be able to say what an exact figure is in terms of how much um, car, car tire wear is, um, uh, important, but I, it is especially, you know, in urban areas, a main source of microplastic pollution. And in addition to the actual polymer and rubber itself, there's a lot of heavy metals and other plasticizers, which are in tires, which can additionally cause a lot of harm. Um, in terms of reformulating the um, tires themselves, this again is a bit of a tricky question, a little bit outside my expertise, since I'm not so good on material science. Um, but as the um, questioner has already said, indeed, you know, they need to have a certain functionality for them to be safe. 
Um, so I think that, um, yeah, this is still an area of research about how to best design the materials so that we can keep the functionality, but then, um, yeah, have less environmental consequences. So I would say to be developed. Maybe we can ask someone from Michelin to come and give a talk <laughs> about this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, uh, our a listener from Japan is asking, uh, do you have any information on behavior or pollution of nanoplastic in aquatic animals? Uh, or is it difficult to detect or, or not? Yeah, so here it's really difficult to detect. So uh, not just in aquatic animals, uh, but generally nanoplastics are really difficult to detect because oftentimes the size resolution um, or mass concentration, which can be measured by traditional microplastic analysis techniques like FTIR or micro Raman or um, TGMS, it's just the nanoplastics are too small and too dilute concentration. So um, at the end of the presentation, I mentioned a few areas which we're working for microplastic and nanoplastic. So we made a little bit of a, a workaround about, around this. So we, we work in laboratory studies to just look at exposure and fate and transport in a laboratory system. Um, but instead of using um, regular microplastics or nanoplastics, we developed own microplastics and nanoplastics with ha which have a metal tracer inside. And so then we can actually use this metal as a proxy to measure the nanoplastics in these complex systems and then have a much lower detection limit. So we start to get a little bit more information now about the fate and behavior of nanoplastics and also microplastics by um, using these tracer materials in the laboratory systems. So hopefully more information coming soon. Could we imagine to use these um, tracers on uh, plastic that, you know, uh, end up in the, the real environment to be able to say, you know, because we're um, getting all this nanoplastic and microplastic, but it's really hard if it's not like a macro piece where we actually know where it comes from, it's really hard to know where it comes from. So could we use this kind of tracers to, you know, add to our, all the polymers to be able to tell which industry is actually polluting? Yeah. So um, I think that it's a really nice idea, but probably difficult to be able to um, manage because then it would mean that each industry needs to put in an own tracer for their specific materials. And so to date, that doesn't really exist. So, I mean, um, there are certain additives which are typically used in certain products or even different <clears throat> dyes and coloring agents might have some metals inside, um, but it doesn't necessarily trace it back to the source. However, some, um, not in the case of plastic um, pollution, but I have some other colleagues that work more in the textile industry, they're looking at how you can um, identify where um, cotton was grown up and sourced and processed. And there they are able to put a DNA barcode on the plastic, on the, on the cotton as it grows. So you can really trace through the entire um, life cycle and product chain. So it really depends. Um, I think that's only a solution for very targeted applications. Um, but uh, yeah, there are in some sectors, some things like that are starting to be done. Wow, that's impressive and scary probably at the same time. Uh, you've been talking um, quite a bit about uh, banning microplastic in, in the bathroom. And someone is asking about kitchen items such as dishwashing sponges. Um, do you know if they are uh, thinking about uh, possible bans uh, on this or, or any other uh, material from the kitchen? <laughs> yeah, so the bans and regulations are really, at least now, just focused on things that are already microplastic as they're produced. So maybe something like a kitchen sponge is already a large material which could break down into microplastics. And so in that way, it's not really... Um, a, subject to these different regulations because it's already a macroplastic item which could form microplastics. But there are some other things in the kitchen or, or laundry room which contain um, microplastics or nanoplastics. So, I mean, a lot of soaps can still contain um, nanoplastics or in laundry detergent. Um, they're used for encapsulating um, the scent that's in your laundry detergent, for example. So um, this would be an example of something that would be under the new regulation because it's already nano or microplastic when it's used in the final product. And so it would be subject to these different regulations. All right, thank you. 
Uh, let me check. Yeah. Uh, regarding the future of plastic rich, uh, research, which stakeholders do you believe are missing in this conversation and could have the biggest impact? Well, I guess that those are kind of almost two different questions, because I feel like there's already a lot of stakeholders which are involved in the conversation, which is super excellent. I mean, I think that we as scientists are um, getting more and more funding and more and more people are getting interested to work on this topic. So I think that science and universities is really are really engaged. Um, more recently, discussing with different companies, um, not only the colleague that I worked with BASF on this project, but a lot of different companies are interested um, to, you know, make better and more sustainable materials. And also um, regulatory agency, not really regulatory agencies, but, um, you know, wastewater treatment works and other drinking water treatment works are interested in developing standardized protocol to be able to measure, you know, their wastewater effluent or their finished drinking water. Um, and as we see, plastic regulation is also is also coming. So um, I think that there are many stakeholders that are already involved, which is great. Um, in terms of which one will make the the biggest impact, I mean, I always think, as with many things in life, it's a team a team effort. So everybody can um, you know bring in their own perspective and expertise, and I think that's really how we're going to be able to work. I don't think that academics is better or regulation is better. I think it's a team effort all around. Yeah, it's not, it's not about being better or, or worse. It's, it's about uh, listening to each other, I think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a really, like, like you say, like everywhere in, in life, um, communication is key, right? Yeah. Um, let me check if we have any other question. Yeah. Do you think technology is the key to tackle this, gen uh, this challenge? or changing behavior from the customer will really drive solutions. Um, I want to add that uh, I've not, or maybe I missed it, but I've not heard you talk about just stop using plastic and maybe go back to um, the, uh, how do you call that in, uh, in English, uh, the um, deposit of uh, um, glass bottles and reusable uh, glass bottles. Uh, do you think that could be you know, a way of changing our behavior uh, that will tackle the, the challenge or uh, the, the regulation and the technology would tackle this, this challenge? Yeah. So, I mean, again, uh, easy answer, but a little bit of both. I mean, so um, <laughs> in terms of technology, I mean, if we do really design plastics, which are designed for recycling and reuse, I mean, it's really through all stages of the life cycle, which are important. So you make plastics which are designed to be recycled at the end of the use. Um, and so that is really a technological change that can happen. But in terms of changing consumer behavior, I think that it goes deeper than just switching like for like. So it's not just having, uh, now we have a plastic bottle, but instead have a glass bottle. It's really probably about reducing consumption and re reducing overall. And that's a little bit harder to change, I think, also speaking personally. So, um, you know, I was discussing with um, a colleague recently and they asked, okay, what do you think in the textile sector is the best way to reduce microplastic fibers and for more sustainability in the textile sector? And I was like, buy less clothes, you know, that is the bottom line, just buy less. I mean, I'm not very good at that. I, even during lockdown, I still bought some new clothes, <laughs> even though nobody sees me. Um, well, we but, see you. <laughs> yeah, now you see me. So yeah, I'm one of my new shirts, but um, yeah. So um, I think that it's really just reduction. And then when we think about exchanging like for like and how um, possible that is in all circumstances, I mean, you gave the example of plastic bottle for deposits on glass bottle, um, but it's again, not only the waste and recycling aspect. So to deliver these glass bottles, they're much heavier. And then, so for transport, it will um, create a lot of extra CO2 to move these heavy bottles all around. So it's um, really considering the life cycle assessment across the entire product use and not only during the use or disposal phases. Thank you. Um, there's something I don't understand. So we'll just read it, read it out loud. Maybe you can help me with this. Um, it says, uh, great idea. It will also help recyc uh, recyclability and BASF work on it. 
would, would yeah, you know so what BASF, BASF is? Yeah, BASF is the, is the German chemical company that I worked with uh, writing this um, perspective paper. Of course. Yeah, um, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I know, I don't know exactly all of their activities that they're doing. Um, I'm only, you know, involved in a small portion, but they are really a um, very large chemical company that is also really invested in um, looking at biodegradable materials and research questions, which are not even necessarily direct, directly related to the products that they produce. Um, so I think that um, them and also a lot of other large companies are starting to pick up the ball and you know do their part because I think that even though it is industry and sometimes um, and for those of us that work in environmental science, industry is somehow villainized. I don't think that that is necessarily um, you know, the, the correct mindset, because it's really, again, this partnership about, you know, everybody working together. So I, I don't think that anybody goes out, hope, hopefully not many people go out purposefully trying to destroy the environment. So I think that the big companies also are trying to make a honest, positive move in the right direction. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. It's, um, once again, I think, like, personally, I think it's, it's communication. It's like, the company should not put everything on the shoulder of customers. Customers should yeah. not put everything on the shoulder of companies. And same with the scientists. Um, I think it, it's a team effort and that it's team communication. And it's also the customers to, you know, tell the companies, the, the industry, what they want and the industry to be able to answer to this question. You were saying that the customers now are willing to pay a little bit more for recycled or or recyclable, <laughs> how do you say this? It's anyway. Recyclable. <laughs> yes, that. <laughs> it's a bit tricky um, one, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's, yeah the, a lot of words are tricky to me in English. <laughs> but um, anyways, yeah, um, I think it's, it's, it's a great time right now for the, the industry to listen to the customers and, and the other way around. And I think it's, it's really interesting. And once again, your, your talk was total, totally in this um, in this you know perspective of working with private companies and research centers and policy makers and i think that's exactly in this boundary that you know big changes are are being made um and i think that that's it for uh that that's it for today we're almost at the top of the hour so um i'm just gonna um if you if you want to uh, give any concluding uh remarks on uh this uh, presentation on your presentation and in the questions. And uh, after that, uh, I will just uh, quickly conclude. No, I don't have any specific other concluding remarks other than to thank you again for inviting me here. And also for those who are tuning in either during the live, live webcast or, or later on the YouTube channel. So thanks again for hanging out with me this morning. Well, thank you. It was, it was really nice to meet you. And I, I hope and I'm sure we will uh, talk again in, in the near future. And yes, as you said, thank you to all of our, thanks to all of our uh, viewers. I hope in this uh, crazy period that, you know, everyone is safe at home. And uh, if you want to um, contact Denise, uh, why don't you send us either an email and we'll forward it to her or you can find her contact info um, on the internet. And uh, if you would like to participate in a uh, in, um, coming webinar as a speaker, please send us an email or if you want to be part of our um, newsletter so you can get an uh, announcement for future uh, webinars, uh, we'll be happy to have you on the list. So just uh, sign in. And uh, we will have next month our first uh, anniversary of the Ocean Plastic webinar. And uh, you will get, uh, yay, we're really excited about it. Um, and more information will uh, come um, in the newsletter, but also on Twitter and uh, on our website. So thanks again, Denise, and thanks again to all of our viewers. And have a really good day or night, evening, wh wherever you are in, in the world. <laughs> Thank you. So usually Ryota um, turns.